Okay, so let's do this. Hello? Hi. So, uh, my name is Jose Canal. I came from Prague to talk to you about Elasticsearch a little bit, and especially what's new with Elasticsearch with the recently uh, released 1.0 version. So, uh, let's jump into it with, with a few questions. Who here actually knows what Elasticsearch is? Good, good. Who actually uses Elasticsearch in production? Awesome. Okay, so uh, I'll, I still have to do the introduction, but I'll, I'll be very brief because uh, because most of the people here already know. So, what actually is Elasticsearch? It's a it's a very buzzword compliant data store. Like whatever the, the, the modern buzzwords is, we we have it. We have HTTP, we have REST, we are based on JSON. It's fully distributed. It does search. It does analytics. It's open source. It's distributed. It scales. Whatever. So it's a, it's a really cool thing. So how do you how do you install this and how do you how do you get this running? So first you need to install Zookeeper and then you need none. Uh, what you actually need to do to get this up and running is you download it, you unpack it, you run it, you're done. That's like one of the one of the nice features about Elasticsearch is that it's very easy to get into. So these are literally the, all the necessary steps that you have to go through to get Elasticsearch up and running. Uh, a word of warning, if you run this command multiple times, you will get multiple nodes that join the same cluster, so you'll uh, have an instant cluster. If you do that right now, right here, all your instances will probably form one a huge giant cluster, which is typically what you don't want. By the way, but it's a it's a very very nice way of still data on conferences. Just start your own Elasticsearch, and by default, it will connect to all the other Elasticsearch instances and get a share of their data. So the cluster will rebalance itself, and part of that data will end up on your computer. There are easy ways to prevent that, and there it's it's not an issue in production, but it can lead to a hilarious situation uh, in in some other settings. So once you have it up and running, probably the first thing that you want to do is like put some data inside and, and get it out. So you can actually treat it like a document data store. You can just put some data in, and again, it's just HTTP and JSON. So you do an HTTP put, uh, you put uh, something in an index, and you, uh, you define the type of the document, the ID, if you don't know 42 is always the answer, and and any, any JSON document you put in. Then you can also get it out, you can delete it, you can update it. Uh, so far, nothing, nothing interesting. There are plenty of databases that can do the same. But what you actually expect from a, from a data store that has search in its name is that it will provide you with search capabilities. So, the first, the first way how to do it is, is you just, you just uh, uh, call an HTTP request, just a, just a get, and you supply Q and any, any string, and it will actually look for that string. Internally, that will, that will translate into, into something like this. So you're calling the underscore search endpoint, and you have a query, which is of type query string, and the actual query is, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit forwards here, conference and topic search. So the conference will search against all fields of all documents, but we are only interested in the string search in any of the, uh, in any of the fields topic across all our document types. So that's the, that's the simple, simple stuff. But typical, typical analytics search query would look something more like this. So it looks scary at first, but it's just basically an, an AST, an abstract syntax tree of the, of the query. So we have a filtered query, and filtered means that it is a filter part and a query part. Then the query part is a, is a bool query, so it, it uses bool logic, and we're defining that the, the matching document must match search in either the field title or description, and here we, we are indicating that title is more important to us than, than description. It's basically a way to, to instruct policy search that this field is really important for us, and if there is a match in this field, 
as opposed to the other field. Like, you should give it more credibility. And then we also have to manage, uh, manage things. Uh, and then we also should match the description. So should means that it doesn't have to match, but if it matches, all the better, all the more power to it. So in, in, this, in this case, we are searching for meetups, and we're looking for meetups that center around search. And of course, we should give a, give a boost to all the meetups that have pizza, right? Because what's a meetup without pizza? Uh, well, sorry. Uh, so, so that's the query part. The filter part, uh, here we just have a simple range filter, and that's important to know. We have a filter and a query. Uh, and the rule of thumb is, always filter when you can, and only query you when you must. Because filters are much faster, they're cacheable and will be cached very aggressively, and will increase your performance greatly. The difference is that filters are boolean. Either a document matches or it doesn't match. Whereas query is more complicated. Query not only tells you that the document matches, but how well it matches. In that case, we are getting back to uh, getting back to, to, to this. Like even if the if, even if the meetup doesn't have pizza, we'll stay interested, but not as much. That's why the pizza bar is in the query and not in the filter. Because the query is the part that's variable, that will actually determine the score of the document, the quality of the match. So how far, how far can we take this? Quite far. Don't worry, I, I, I don't expect you to be able to read this. But this is just, uh, this is actually the working query in the Stack Overflow data set that goes and looks for questions uh, where people ask about a problem with MySQL. It searches the DBA. Uh, DBA Stack Exchange or org site. So we're explicitly looking for, uh, we're again searching in title and body for something that contains MySQL, but also doesn't contain NoSQL. But it also has, uh, has, it also doesn't contain NoSQL, but it also has a child, so it has an answer to that question. Or somebody mentions NoSQL. So we are looking for somebody asking for a problem with MySQL and somebody just answering, just use any NoSQL solution. We're basically looking for trolls on, on Stack Overflow. There are quite a few, so this, this query always works. And now I just use a filter to limit that I'm only interested in something that happened uh, uh, last year and this year. And this is, this is a very interesting part because Stack Overflow has some data on its own, like what the users uh, think is a, is a good question or a good answer. And the assumption here is, uh, and that's a debate for another time, that, that humans know best. And if humans voted a question that is a very good question, we should take that into account, right? And we should just put it right there on the top. So, but we don't really want to sort just by the quality of the question. Because what would happen then is that you have a you have a question that barely matches your query, but it's but it's of decent quality and it will be on the top. You don't want that. You want to sort of combine these two these two values: the value of how well the document matches and how good a quality a question is, and and come up with a formula that will that will provide you the best answer. So the so the, queer, uh, the question that matches okay, but is a very good quality, should be on the top. But also the question that's not so good, not so well rated by the users, but it's a really perfect match, should also be on the top. So that's what we're doing here, and we're actually writing our own, our own script, our own code, that will actually express this formula in a mathematical sense. And we are also doing some highlighting and some aggregations, that's not important. But this is just, a, just an idea of what you can do with the, with the DSL. So, I said in the beginning that I'll, I'll want to talk to you about the, the 1.0 features that, that we released. So, let's jump right through it. So, the first, the, the first, big, uh, first big feature that we released is aggregations. 
And previously we had, we had facets, which, which a lot of people use as aggregations and it, it's perfectly fine, but they had, there was a little bit of a problem with it. Because you had, you had terms aggregation and you had statistical aggregation or statistical facet. So what that would do is, a terms facet would give you the distribution of, of the documents matching your query per given uh, field value. So if you have tags, it will give you the number of documents per given tag. If you had, uh, if you had categories, it will give you the numbers per category. And you also have statistical facet that would give you statistics on a field. So the, the average number of comments and the maximum and the minimum and the number of uh, sum of squares and all the all the different things that that statistics people really like. And then somebody came that I want I want a both I want statistics per term value. So we came up with term stats. But you always have to wait for for us or for authors of philosophy search to implement this. You could, you could not ever combine your, uh, the facets to make your own stuff. That's what aggregations is. It's a, it's a way to take facets and make them composable the way that you compose our queries. If you saw earlier, I, I used a bool query and inside of that I used a multi-match query and a match query. That's sort of the same idea here with aggregations. So let's see how it works, and if we if we have time at the end, I'll actually show some real life demo because this is a this is a little dry, I admit. So with aggregations, what you do is you first define some buckets, and you can define the buckets. Uh, you can just define one big bucket using the global. You can just define a limited subset of global using a filter. You can define buckets per, per time interval, for example, monthly buckets or daily, hourly, that's the histogram. You can define buckets by a distance from one geo point. So you can uh, define buckets per uh, distance from the center of Bratislava, like 0 to 10 kilometers, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. So this is just to just group basically the documents together. And then within these buckets, you can run actual aggregations. So you can just ask for count, how many documents fall into, into this bucket. You can ask for, for the maximum of a given field. So what's the maximum rent in from, from 0 to 10 kilometers from the center of this lava? And how is it from 10 to 20? Or what's, what's the, the average salary? Or you can just ask for, for all the stats, or even the extended stats, and again you will get the, the standard deviation and the sum of all squares and all the things that I just repeat and don't really understand. So that's, that's aggregations. It's composable uh, facets. Facets are, I mentioned this for the people who know Elasticsearch who have used it, for those uh, of you who haven't used Elasticsearch before, it's just a way to uh, divide your documents into buckets and then run aggregations within those buckets. And of course, the fun part is you can nest even, even the buckets. So you can have a bucket per, per tag, and then within each tag, you can have a bucket uh, per, per day. So in one pass over the data, in a single query, you can do nested aggregations like this. So that's aggregations. Uh, I have a really cool demo, so if we, if we don't run out of time, we'll see it. The next part is, uh, next part. Next part is Snapshot and Restore. Snapshot and Restore is an API to actually back up your, back up your cluster and um, put your data somewhere safe. Uh, either just for safety or because you want to get into it or for, for some other for some other purposes. Of course that was possible before, but it was a, it was a manual process. In 0.90 and before, what you had to do is you would have to disable flushing, so uh, if search won't keep writing new data onto disk, then you would have to locate all the primary shards and then distribute 
distributed environment, like all the master versions of the data, you have to copy them somewhere and they enable the flush again. Not a hard process, but not generally something that's fun or easy to do. So in 1.0, this all comes down to one API call. So you say that you want to put a snapshot into a repository and you want to name it this. That's all there is to it. Like, you just name, name a repository, in this case it's production S3, and you want to create a snapshot that's like 10th of, uh, 10th of October 2013. So that's, that's what Snapshot Restore essentially boils down to. If you want to be more technical, what Snapshot Restore is, it's, it's a backup solution that does incremental backups that can back up to any, any different uh, kind of repository. It can be S3, it can be HDFS, it can be a local file system, it can, you can define your own. Uh, you, can, uh, you can, of course, roll back the index to the previous state. You don't just have to uh, always restore it to the, to the last one. You can even, when restoring the index, you can rename it. So you can use that to copy an index within the same cluster. You will just back it up and restore it under a different name. You can even restore it to a different cluster. So you can do that when you move data from production to testing, so you refresh your testing environment, or you can do it for to do an offline replication to between data centers. So it's a it's a concept that can be used for for any of these any of these purposes. So how does this actually work? You just create a repository, that's the first step. So in this case, I'm creating a repository that's named local. It's of type file system, and the type of file system is only really interested in the location. Now that this is probably not anything that you would ever want to use in production, because backing up a fully distributed system into one machine into a local directory is not really advisable under any conditions. So typically you, you would want to use something distributed on its own to do the backup. S3, HDFS, uh, any sort of clustering file system, whatever. So uh, that's, that's the repository. Now when you want to create a snapshot within the repository, you just reference the repository, you name your snapshot, and you give it some options. For example, here I'm, I'm saying that I want to index all the indices except all those that start with test. It's pretty obvious why I don't want to hit back up all the indices that start with test. And this is this is actually how you do it. You can uh, have some any additional uh, parameters for the snapshot, but these are the most useful. Just limit the number of indices or the actual indices that you want to back up. So that's backing up. What does restore look like? Previously, it looked like this. You had to close the index, and uh, in some cases, you even had to had to shut down uh, shut down the cluster. In some cases, if you if you can afford it, you can just spin up new nodes. Then you then you find all the existing shards. You rewrite their data from the data that you previously copied somewhere. And then you start uh, start the nodes back up again. Again, not something that's too hard, but it's very very tedious. In 1.0, if the index is there and you want to replace it, you have to close it, and then you just call the repository, the the snapshot name, and underscore store. That's it. And again, you can give it options like I only want to I only want to restore indices that start with line underscore. Or I can say that I want to restore it under a different name, thus essentially creating a copy of the data. So that's, that's snapshot restore. It's nothing magical, it's just a very convenient way how to, how to back up your data and restore them back into, into Elasticsearch. Okay, the next feature that, that has been greatly improved in 1.0 is the percolator feature. So the percolator feature is a reverse search. So typically with, with Elasticsearch or any sort of search engine, 
you would index documents and then you run queries against the documents. With Percolator, it's the other way around. You index your queries and then you run the documents. So essentially, you create alerts and you can use all the power of Elasticsearch to, to create queries and then when you put in a document, Elasticsearch will come back to you and say, hey, those three queries that you registered earlier, one of them actually matches this document, just in case you were interested. So that's what Percolator is. The way it actually works is again, again just a simple API call. So there's a there's a special type called dot percolator in all of your indices. You can just register a query under any any ID, and you put in the query with any arbitrary metadata. You can use all the power of Elasticsearch in, in this in this query, and then when you actually want to run the percolation, you just send in a document and you get back the list of the queries that you stored previously that will manage. So super powerful feature if you want to do something like alerts. It's very nice if you have any sort of dynamic categories. Imagine that you have a, you have a site containing articles and it's very easy to create a category based on the search. But then it's super hard to actually take a document, take an article and, and ask your, your database or your system, to which categories does this article belong to? Because that's the reverse operation and that's always hard. And that's what percolation will do for you. It will, it will tell you, oh, it belongs to these categories because it will run all the, all the queries and determine which of them match. So what are the, what are the changes? Because this is, a, this is a feature that we've had for, for a long time. So just very briefly, it's currently now stored in percolator type. Previously it was its own index. And that might look like a, like a cosmetic change, but it's actually very important because now when it's typed within your index, it leaves the control up to you. Like, how many shards does this index have? Over how many nodes is this index spread out? How many replicas does this index have? It's all up to you. Previously, we controlled it. We said that it has only one shard, it's, and it's replicated on every single one of your nodes. Which worked fine, but didn't really scale up, because if you only had one shard, and it was distributed on all of your nodes, all of your nodes had to store all the percolators. So if you had 100,000, it's okay. It's, it's not a big load. If you have, if you have a billion, that's impossible. Because at that point, every node in your cluster would have to store these billion queries and run against them. And that's just, not only is it not practical, it's almost impossible unless, unless you have ungodly hardware. And the second, uh, second change is, is no less important, is we changed uh, from uh, serial execution to parallel. So, I feel that I've been talking for way too long without actually showing anything, uh, anything tangible. So let's jump into the demo and figure out how to.
I get I get back the results. And this is this is what I've been this is what I've been looking for. So I have per tag I have the number of documents that matches this query. So unsurprisingly, the most the most documents uh, fall into the tag Python. The second uh, most common one is programming languages. So this query actually matches 266 uh, questions that fall into the uh, that have the top tag Python, 73 with the tag programming languages, and so on and so forth. And back here we have the same the same numbers, but not per tag, but per actually month. So this month is let's say it's January 2012. Looks like January. <laughs> of course, it's a it's a unique timestamp to down to the millisecond, but January just looks so much better. So this is facets. This is something that you've been able to do with Elasticsearch since its very conception. So now let's move to uh, let's move to uh, to, fast, uh, to aggregations. So the only thing that you need to do is I, I, the query remains the same. But here, instead of facets, I suddenly use ads. It would have to spell aggregations, but since I'm very lazy and Elasticsearch allows it, I just say ads. And nothing, nothing too interesting here. If I run it, I get the same results, yeah, except in a slightly different format. Now I actually see the buckets, and it's actually called buckets, and I see for each key, I see, I see the count. But the numbers still match. So in the next step, let's do something more interesting. Let's actually do the nested aggregation. So here, I still have the, the aggregation per tag. But I also add inside, within these buckets, I also add another aggregation that I said I'm interested in the average comment count. So not only do I get a, uh, do I get a count of documents per bucket, but I also get, uh, but I also get a number of average number of comments for that uh, for the tag. So we can immediately see that in the that in uh, the questions with the tag Python, and there's 266 of those, they have four almost four comments on average. For programming languages. They have six columns on average. So already we see some, some added value. We see the, 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 the distribution per tag, and for each of the tag we see some interesting number. I mean, four is really interesting, right? No? Okay. I'll regret my joke. So let's take it even further. Here we start we start the same. I'm asking, I want, a, I want a distribution per tag, I am looking for average comment count, but I also want to see the actual, inside the comments, I want to see the top authors of the comments. And for each of these, I want to see the max score. So, in one pass of the data, I'll split them by tag, within each tag, I'll calculate some aggregation of one field, and on other field, I'll again split it by, by some value, in this case the common author, and I will, for each author, I'll also give you the maximum score. So, code is it better than a thousand words. So, here we can see that, again, we still only have 266 uh, questions for the tag Python. They have four comments on average, now we can actually verify because there are 821 comments, which makes sense. And we see that the, the people that commented the most on this tag. So the winner is Martin Peters, who I, I found recently, I've been doing this talk for, for quite some time, so I've actually figured out who this guy is. It's a guy in Sweden who is really interested in Python, so he comments a lot on, on Stack Exchange. And he commented 28 times on a, on a Python questions, and his best comment was awarded the score of 8 by the, by the readers, by the users of Stack Exchange. 
and so on and so forth. And we can see that, that the second one, guys back there, can you keep it down a little bit? Thank you. So the second most, uh, most, uh, most prolific author was Knapp with 14, and so on and so forth. And we can actually, we can actually scroll down and see the same thing per, there's a lot of data. And we can see the same thing per month. So again, per month, we can see uh, how many how many documents, how many questions were in Stack Overflow, and how many uh, how many comments, and what are the top ten people that commented for that month, and what was their best score for a comment in that month. All this in a single single pass on the data that took nine milliseconds. Sure, I cheated a little bit. I preloaded everything, and right, I ran this this command a couple of times. But that's what you would do in your application, anyways. And it's actually run against all the data from programmers against you. So it's some 500 megabytes of data. So still a small data set, but a non-trivial one. So this is these were aggregations. Do I still have some time? Okay, if I still have some time. And there is one last set of APIs that I want to talk to you about. Anybody knows what it is? So it's a it's a cat API. And we introduced the cat API because humans really suck at reading JSON. I've heard some arguments earlier, so let's let's do a little quiz. I guarantee that this is enough information to tell you what is the master node of your cluster. Can anybody actually read this? I'll, I'll take that as a no. What you actually have to do is you have to see the master node ID, and then in the in the list of nodes, you have to locate that 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 ID and then locate the transport address and then look at the IP address. Sure, it's doable, it's not that hard, it's super trivial for a computer. But for a human, if somebody wakes you up at 3 in the morning, there's something wrong with your cluster, you need to fix it. You really don't want to go through this. So what you can do instead, is you just call the, the, the cat API, and you just said cat master, and we'll just give you, give you the master. So that's that's what Cat API is. It's a it's a system administrator friendly, grappable API that gives you an immediate image of what's going on inside your cluster. So master is one of those to, to immediately get back that the master node. The second one is count, so you can actually say like, hey, give me the count of uh, count of documents, and it will actually give you the uh, the time, and it will tell you. Uh, what number of documents you currently have in your list. There are several other several other kind of APIs, and you can you can customize them heavily. That you can say which columns do you want returned back, and do you want the you want the header row and everything. So it's really nice to immediately see what's going on inside your cluster right now, and it's human readable. That's it. that's the biggest that's the biggest advantage. And that's it. That's all the APIs. So if there are any questions or any requests for more demos, I actually have demos for all the features I, I talked about. I'm not sure we have time enough for those, but if you are interested, find me later. And now, any questions? No? Nobody interested? There is a question? Typically, it's just a data store. So, 
any any tool you can find or use to to parse the data and and extract the text out of it and dump it in Elastic Search will do. Uh, for for this particular use case, there is actually a plugin into Elastic Search that's called Attachments that will actually uh, use Apache Tika, which is a project that will be able to parse PDFs and Word documents. Everything can extract the text and dump it into Elastic Search so it will be searchable. So uh, that's that, but typically you want to write your own crawler that will collect the data and dump it into dump it into Elasticsearch. Does that work for you? Yeah, it was part one it was for uh, collecting the data, but then the, the okay, for search the interface to search for it. Okay, so we actually have a, we actually have a, a, a small front end to to Elasticsearch that's called uh, that's called Kibana. And this is actually one instance of Kibana that that uh, that just uh, visualizes the stats from, from the cluster, what the cluster has been doing. And one of the parts of it is somewhere here I should have a query where I can just I can just query whatever and it will, it will actually give me give me the results. So in this case there's a better dashboard for that. Here I can Here I can see the individual results. So because because Elasticsearch talks over HTTP and, and talks JSON, this is a pure JavaScript application that runs along the browser that can actually query query up Elasticsearch. So you can use this one. You can you can uh, use it here to find actually uh, actually the exact documents, or you can actually configure it to provide you with some inside in forms of graphs and aggregations and everything like that to, to gain. For example, in, in this will this will enable you to uh, see how uh, how much data does each directory contain recursively just by running a simple aggregation on, on the path. So uh, the, 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 that was the very long and very not relevant answer. The short answer is Kibana, or you write your own, which is super easy because it's just HTTP and JSON. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Yep. So thank you for having me, and come see me if you want to talk about Elasticsearch. Thanks.